Greetings, fellow Beyonders. I am your humble host and scribe, Sven, and this is Beyond the Worlds Beyond. The primary purpose of this series will be exploring the lore and story within these campaigns. In this episode, we'll be looking at the seventh episode of The Wizard, the Witch, and the Wild One, titled Kahuna. We'll be doing a quick summary of the episode and then diving into the lore questions that it raises and those that it answers. We begin, as we left off, with a grand reception by Gil Mage Morrow, who it turns out is somewhat of a fanboy for Soft and Stone, with a collection about them that Suvi will later gain access to. Most of the episode is social interaction and discussion, so the summary will be a bit brief in that regard. We learn that Morrow's research is responsible for the Derrick out at sea and has had, he believes, revolutionary results. Results we later see that sometimes enhance magical foci with extreme levels of power. We also have our first in-person encounter with Guild Mage Payne, who find that he is looked down upon and set in an administrative role, one that gives him access to the finances of the Chantry. He does little to provide any reason for the party to not act against him, though Ame is still hesitant. Thus, a plan is formed for Ursulon and the Fox to sneak into Payne's office and seek out more information and documents to support the decision and to use if they decide to proceed. Unfortunately, the plan quickly goes awry. The distraction comes too late and Payne, present in his office, meets Ursulon before the latter has a chance to go invisible. While the Fox does succeed at gaining entry, things do not go well for Ursulon. Attempting to communicate to Payne that they need to talk to him about the threat of gallows, Payne instead takes it as a personal threat. Wounding himself to frame Ursulon, he moves to grab our wild one in a shocking grasp, and with that cliffhanger, we end for this week. Before we start asking new questions, let's take a look at the ones we've asked before and see which, if any, we now have answers for. Previously, I had wondered if we would receive any redeeming details about Payne that might make a choice to turn him in a hard one for the party. If Brennan had planned such details to exist, it seems things have come to a head before they will have a chance to be revealed. So, assuming the party comes out victorious in the conflict ahead, I imagine Payne will be out of the picture one way or another. We had pondered about the nature of the Derek and his ties, if any, to what is happening with Naram and the Kudzu. While the final answer is not yet given, it certainly seems like the probable cause of this particular woe. Moro believes he has discovered something revolutionary, and magical foci are produced to vastly more powerful strength, though still seemingly at random. I am fairly confident in saying that his discovery, knowingly or not, is drawing upon Naram's power, if not his actual living spiritual essence, to empower these objects. In turn, Arima's fury, in the form of the kudzu, is retaliating against those harming her beloved. If this does turn out to be the case, it will be very interesting to see the conflict for Suvi. Her own interactions with spirits will lend some empathy, but the benefit of Moro's discovery to the war effort is also certainly a factor. Will she decide such matters, for good or ill, are beyond the handling of the party at this time? Will she seek to end the experiments despite the cost to the Empire? Only time will tell. We also get some further insight on wizards, mages, and naming conventions, though still not enough to draw final conclusions. Moro, we learn, nearly succeeded at testing within the Citadel, but did not pass the final test. Pain, in turn, was even below this, with Moro looking down to him as Subi looks down on Moro. As such, if adopting these names is something of the Citadel, it is something that happens fairly early in training, and it's not solely upon some higher rank or position. This matches with Suvi using Suvi as her Citadel name, and not simply a diminutive nickname of her actual name. It also answers our previous question as to if Moro or Payne had ever had affiliation with the Citadel, or if mages in general take such names. The latter may still be true, though a hedge mage like Finley saw no power in names, but so far all we've met with these names have at least trained at the Citadel. As for new questions, besides the obvious of what the outcome of combat shall be, 
we learn of two new locations in this episode. The first is Old Thriss, a community in Akan, although sadly all we hear is its name, but it is evocative enough to raise questions. Port Talon itself already seems to be a very old settlement with layers of history and construction. How ancient then must Old Thriss be to have gained such a moniker? Also, does this mean there is a new Thriss somewhere in the Empire? The other is Sarazmir, somewhere in the Empire, that is home to the prime chorus of the Scepter's Chorus. Given that we have the Saraz Imperium and Kem Saraza already named, there is an obvious linguistic connection. Plus, to be home of the prime chorus, it suggests the city is one of import. Is this perhaps the capital city of the Empire? That's my personal hunch, but it remains to be seen. Similarly, at one point, the Chantry within Port Talon is referenced as the Calabell Chantry. What is the significance of Calabell? We know, obviously, that it is not based on the city nor on the name of the island. Is it perhaps the greater province of the Empire that Akam is part of, or is it something else entirely? The question is also raised as to what knowledge the Citadel truly has regarding Grandmother Wren. Soft, stone, and steel were well acquainted with her true power and importance, but it seems that the briefing given to the mages of the guild did not include any such information. At what levels is this information shared and compartmentalized? Finally, what information is stored within the records Morrow has kept about soft and stone? Plus, well, not a question. Damn, how evocative was that library description? I just want to live in it. That's all for this installment of Beyond the Worlds Beyond. As always, please feel free to throw your own questions and theories in the comments as I love hearing what others latched on to. Also, please consider liking and subscribing if you have not already. If you want more Worlds Beyond number content, you can also visit my Patreon, link below, uh, to find my appendix and timeline projects, all of which are free and publicly available. I've been your host, Sven, and thank you very much for listening. Farewell, for now, fellow Beyonders.